What is the leading cause of death among young Australians? So you just have a oh, you would be wow. happy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> suicide. I heard suicide on the back. I heard dr drink driving. Yeah. Um, well, I think drink driving would probably be a close second. I know in America it is. But actually, yes, suicide is the leading cause of death among Australians aged 15 to 24. And it's not, it's not just Australia. Before the 1960s, teenage suicide was virtually non-existent among American youth. But by 1980, almost 400,000 adolescents had attempted suicide each year. And by 1987, suicide had become the second largest killer of teens after car accidents, as Jono was mentioning. So the issue has become really relevant to young people. And so because of how sensitive and important this topic is, I thought I'd focus my talk today on the topic of suicide because it actually pops up in our passage today. It's one of the five times it pops up in our passage in, in the Bible. Now, I don't know if you knew this, but the Roman Catholic Church teaches that suicide is a mortal sin that um, sends people to hell. It's an unforgivable type of sin according to the Roman Catholic Church. But we're not Roman Catholic. We're, we're Christian. So how do we as Christians think about this really important topic? And does it mean we lose our salvation? Well, the first thing I want to stress is suicide doesn't forfeit your salvation. You don't lose your salvation if, if that did happen. I want to ask you a question. What was the difference between Judas and Peter? Think about it. They both denied Jesus. Just have a think for a second. Who did Judas take his guilt to? If you look with me in verse 3, Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, What is that to us? See to it yourself. He departed and went out and hanged himself. It's one of the darkest moments in the Bible. Jesus took his guilt to those, do you see who it was? The chief priests and elders? To those who represented the old covenant, like the Jewish old covenant. And he found no forgiveness there. Instead, what does it say? What did the religious leaders say? Verse 4. What is that to us? See to it yourself. And that, that's because in Hebrews 10, it says, Every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, should be coming up on the screen, which can never take away sin. The old covenant can never take away sin. However, Peter waited, didn't he? And he met with Jesus after Jesus rose. And Jesus said before he died that the Passover meal represented the new covenant in his blood. After Jesus had died and then risen, he could now offer forgiveness for sins that was not yet available under the old covenant. The difference then is that Judas brought his guilt to the priests of the old covenant whose sacrifices, Hebrews said, could not take away sin. And so he ended up taking that guilt, as Miriam said, onto himself, while Peter brought his guilt to Jesus, who paid for his sin. And consider his guilt. He had betrayed the Lord of the universe. What sin could be any worse than Peter's sin? And yet, in John 21, 15, Jesus restores Peter, saying, on the screen, when they have finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, be my lambs. In other words, come back, be my disciple. And Peter isn't the first person forgiven of a major sin in the Bible. It's actually important to remember, a believer is capable of taking the life of someone, as David did in the case of Uriah, without losing his salvation. Just in case you don't remember, David... Um, wanted to sleep with Bathsheba, slept with Bathsheba, realised he was going to have a child, so he actually ordered Uriah to go to the front lines of the fighting where he would certainly be killed. David killed Uriah. And do you recall what happened after the prophet Nathan came to David and pointed out his sin? Nathan said, Why have you despised the word of the Lord 
to do what is evil in his sight. You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. You have murdered David. And what did David do? David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord has put away your sin. You will not die. Hang on. David is guilty of murder. How is it possible for David to be forgiven? David trusts in God's promised saviour, Jesus. He says, against you, you alone have I sinned, and you know, and I'm guilty in your sight. And yet he asks God to forgive him because of his promised saviour. As Hebrews 10 says, every priest stands there at every service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all, all, including David, all time, a single sacrifice for sins. He trusted in the Saviour to come. Now, if we believe Jesus' blood is capable of forgiving any sin, wouldn't his blood also cover the sin of suicide? So let me make this really clear, so just in case you didn't miss it, you missed it. Suicide isn't the unforgivable sin. Suicide isn't the unforgivable sin. The only unforgivable sin is a lack of turning to Jesus which is what Judas failed to do. It's what the chief priest failed to do. Which is exactly what Peter ended up doing. He returned back to Jesus. And so the point, if you look at Judas, you look at Peter, don't try and deal with your guilt yourself. Judas tried to take it to the Jewish leaders, and they said it's your responsibility, not ours. And he was left carrying his own guilt. He died under God's curse. He is more than capable, Jesus is more than capable of taking your sin, whatever it is, and nailing it to the cross. And I think this brings comfort and hope to those who have maybe attempted suicide in the past, or who have lost a loved one to suicide. It's not the unforgivable sin. Every sin can be nailed to the cross. But the second thing I want to know, suicide isn't a wise course of action because in so doing we take the place of God. Do you know there's five instances in the Bible where suicide is mentioned? Four times in the Old Testament, one, and this passage in the New Testament. And what, what we see with Judas, as with all the other passages, is in the context of shame and defeat. However, when Jonah and Job hit rock bottom, and if you recall what we learned from Job, Job's life was as bleak as life could be. Losing all his possessions, Job lost his family, Job lost his health, his wife told him to die, and then all of his friends told him it was his fault. It doesn't get much lower than Job. And yet, Job doesn't take his life. Now, that doesn't mean he didn't ask for God to take his life. He did. But when he does, he acknowledges one important thing. Ultimately, it's God is the one in charge of taking life, not him. So he prayed it, and he didn't take it into his own hands. Job says in chapter 1, verse 11, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken them away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. If we try and take our own lives, then we're really standing in the place of God. So we should respect, honour and value that life and take our pain to God. Which brings me to my first point. God has a purpose for our life that we can't, often can't see. God has a purpose for our life that we often can't see. I want to share with you a little story. It's a really sad story. I had a friend... Um, her name is Tanya. I have a friend. Her name is Tanya. Is Tanya. And when I was at university, she came over from America. And in her church, they said, oh, God has spoken to me. She came from a charismatic church uh, where they believe God talks to us like whispers in our heart and stuff like that. God has told me God's got a big plan for you in, a, in Australia. God has a big plan for you. He's going to use you in Australia. So she left America. She came to Australia. She joined my church. And she waited. God's got this big plan for me. And after a while of waiting, nothing amazing was happening in her life. And so one day I, I um, went over to her house and um, she wasn't there. And her carers didn't know where she was. And then we found there was a note in her, in her room and, and it was a note saying that she'd kind of given up on life and given up on God. And so, so then I frantically drove around trying to find her. And I looked in different parks, anywhere that we'd hung out before, and eventually I found her um, in, in a park, and she had um, she was under a, under a tree, passed out, and she 
um, tried to take her own life. And so what I, what I did was I, I grabbed her up and I tried to take her, lift her up, I took her to my car, and thankfully there was someone walked past who was uh, a nurse and was able to kind of help me organize uh, an ambulance and took her to the hospital and she recovered and she's fine today, right? Um, but she, the, the issue was, she, once someone had lied to her saying, God, God told me this amazing plan, right? So she had the wrong message. But she couldn't see how God could possibly have a plan for her. Today, she's married with kids. She's still trusting Jesus. And God has still been using it and it working her life. But she couldn't see how God had that plan for her. So we should, we should pray for wisdom and pray for, um, you know, hope of heaven. But we must ultimately ask God's will be done. And trust that God has a plan now look at the life of Peter as an example of this. He betrayed Jesus three times. And after the rooster crowed, he wept bitterly. Think of how low Judas was. Here is a guilty man who has hit rock bottom. Betraying the Lord of the universe, who was being led to the cross. It would seem this was the end, and there's no hope for Peter left. And yet earlier in Luke 31, Jesus says, Satan has asked to sift you, but I have prayed for you that after you fall... You will turn back and you will, you will um, strengthen your brothers, right? Jesus had a plan for Peter, even though he knew Peter was going to hit rock bottom. Jesus prayed for Peter, uh, that God would use him after the lowest day of his life, and God did use Peter. Having been restored, think of how God has used Peter since that moment. Peter preached the first big Christian sermon at Pentecost. 3,000 people were saved, and the Christian church began. Peter became the leader of Jerusalem, of all the Christians in Jerusalem, the capital um, of Christianity at the time. He was given a vision in Acts 10 to 11 that Gentiles, like non-Jewish people, could be saved. And that led to millions and billions of Christians, non-Jewish people being saved because of the vision given to Peter. And he ended up dying on a Roman cross, boldly encouraging other Christians to endure persecution. And think of where we get this account of Peter from. Peter was the only one there with the servant girls. Peter must have told the other disciples so they could write it down, so that we could see from Peter's life, God can work through the darkest times and still bring good out of it. Now, I've heard from first hand an old Christian lady called Ada, who I used to visit in a nursing home, and I remember her telling me she was lonely, her, her, uh, mother had, her husband had passed away and she'd asked the Lord to take her, to take her away. She wanted um, and looked for more than anything to be in heaven. And I heard her say several times, I don't understand why God hasn't taken me away. But she said, well, I'm still here, Mike. Therefore, God must have a purpose. And I know he wants me to share Jesus. She's about 90 years old. So she said, you know what I'm going to do? Until the Lord takes me, I'm going to keep sharing Jesus with my nurses. And that's what Ada did until the Lord took her away. Isn't that a beautiful faith? Even though she's old, even though she's sad, she's lonely, she's grieving, she prays to God to, God to take her, but she also prays that God would use her while she's still here. And so fourthly, the last thing I want to say is we must care for those struggling with mental health conditions to help lift their eyes to Jesus. Have a guess what percentage of people who die from suicide struggle with mental health? Have a guess. Just have a think in your mind. What percentage? 80. I heard some say 80. 100. Some say 100. Um, the Brisbane says 90. 90% 90 of people who, who um, die by suicide have an underlying mental health condition, especially depression, bipolar, substance abuse. So, really important to stay connected with people with mental health. Recognising that worsening mental health condition could make them start thinking about the darker forms. Have a conversation with what's going on in their mind and ask for help from your leaders here and from mental health professionals. And I want to share, like, I've actually got to that point before. I had depression, I've shared that before. And I actually got to the point where I didn't really feel like I wanted to live anymore. And, and because I felt like the tunnel was so dark, there's no light in the tunnel. That's how I felt when I was having depression. And I, I can tell you, 
Since then, when I've been in dark times, I've actually found the Psalms a great comfort. Because it reminds me, other Christians like David have had really dark times, and they modeled how to respond by taking my pain to God. And it reminded me, no matter how dark the tunnel gets, God understands. Do you remember what Jesus says in the, the Garden of Gethsemane? He says, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Sorrowful to death. Jesus knew the deepest darkness of the soul so that he even despaired of life. So when we pray, we can pray to a God who understands. And these Psalms reassure me that God's promise says there is a light at the end of the tunnel. The light of God's love, the light of the hope of heaven. The promise will he'll one day work all the bad things for good. As C.S. Lewis once said, Heaven wants a chain, will work backwards and turn even agony into glory. So I want to close. I'm going to pray the words of Romans 8. So let's bow our heads and pray these words together.